France's nuclear industry has a problem. In the midst of Europe's latest energy crisis, half of its reactors are offline, and it's struggling to turn them back on. Delays in maintenance, strikes and corrosion issues in several reactors have brought France's electricity grid to its knees. France's nuclear fleet is rapidly aging, with most of its reactors reaching the 40-year mark, without new ones ready to replace them. This is a story of industrial achievement, but also mismanagement and neglect, that has brought one of the world's largest electricity producers to its knees. So how did France's nuclear industry end up in this situation? And can it be saved? 1960, the Gerbois Bleu nuclear test. France entered the club of nuclear armed states, its goal dissuading any repeat of the invasions it faced in the previous 100 years. At that point, France only had a handful of nuclear reactors, mostly for the production of plutonium, for its military. In fact, its civilian program would only start two years later, in 1962. Much of the responsibility for managing it fell to EDF, a state monopoly created in the aftermath of World War II, aimed at guaranteeing France's energy security. The French government also set out to create several state-owned companies that would form the backbone of the French nuclear industry and collaborating with several private firms. But firmly at the helm was the French government whose dirigiste policy led the effort to nuclearization. Yet the real boom for the French nuclear industry would only happen after the oil shocks of the 1970s. At the time, oil made up 64% of the French energy mix versus 46 in Germany. This crippled the French economy, and to ensure France would never be susceptible to an energy shock, the French Prime Minister Pierre Mesmer unveiled what would be called the Mesmer Plan in 1973. Within the year, work had started on three nuclear reactors, with the goal to build 80 by 1985 and 170 by 2000. Eventually, France took a chill pill, realized it wouldn't be practical or economically viable to build so many reactors, and eventually only constructed 58. But the plan worked. Through extreme standardization, with reactors being built in identical batches, France achieved economies of scale and rapid construction. The country's share of nuclear energy shot up to 40% of its energy mix. French industry and consumers would benefit from nearly four decades of cheap electricity sold at a predictable rate. And France would profit enormously from selling electricity to its neighbors. But the phenomenal success of this scale-up also hit some difficulties. One of the reasons for its speed was the top-down decision-making that took place without parliamentary debate, something that would later fuel anti-nuclear activism. And by the end of its nuclear buildup, Increasing power and complexity had lengthened both construction time and cost significantly, with the last batch being more than twice as expensive as the first. And then this happened. The world of power blocks that had seen the creation of France's nuclear industry disappeared, and the world entered an era of economic liberalization. Monopolies were out, and competition was in. This changing environment saw the liberalization of the European energy market starting in the 1990s, which aimed to benefit consumers with lower energy prices and more grid stability. This was accompanied by a wave of privatizations, including of EDF, which was partially privatized in 2007, and the French government took a more hands-off approach to the electricity market. Furthermore, the integration of the EU's market also exposed France's nuclear industry to increasingly virulent anti-nuclear sentiment in Germany and in Austria. This new world would make life difficult for France's nuclear giant. But before we explore how this plan undermined EDF, first a word from this video sponsor, Masterworks. With global markets in turmoil and part because of the energy crisis, the typical stock heavy portfolio is being crushed. Goldman Sachs has specifically recommended real, tangible alternative assets like fine art, and Morgan Stanley recently agreed, setting contemporary art's extremely low correlation to traditional investments. As a result, art's value is less likely to be affected by external factors. That's why when other markets are dropping due to massive sell-offs, art is selling for 26% more at auction compared to this time last year. Masterworks gives you the opportunity to invest in a market that has traditionally been the domain of billionaires. It's now possible to invest in household names like Banksy or Picasso. And since six out of their last seven exits netted over 20% return, people have been lining up to join. So far, 550,000 people have signed up to the waiting list, but into Europe subscribers can skip the wait with the link in the description. So if that sounds interesting to you, check the link down below for more information. Now, back to the video. For EDF, the shift from public to private was a massive culture clash with the idea of public service running deep. Social gaziers and electricians are worried about the arrival of the competition on their market. And workers went out to protest against privatization. This saw two big changes which would negatively impact EDF's finances. Arène and dividends. The French government, which up until then had been able to set the price of its electricity, could no longer do so in a liberalized EU market. 
So what it did was compromise with the EU Commission. The system they developed was called AREN. It allowed EDF to continue selling electricity at a fixed price, the TRV, Tarif de Vente Réglementée. But in exchange, EDF had to sell 100 terawatt hours or 25% of its production to its competitors who could then resell it on the market. This was meant to kickstart competition in the French energy market dominated by EDF, while still allowing French consumers to benefit from cheap nuclear energy. This cost the company roughly 800 million euros per year while subsidizing its competitors. To make matters worse, its new status as a private company with the state as a majority shareholder saw the French government punction dividends amounting to nearly 20 billion euros over the past 15 years. On top of this, EDF's nuclear business was coming under increasing challenge from the growing renewable energy sector. Renewables undermine the economic viability of France's nuclear reactors, which needs to operate continuously to maintain profitability. At the same time, after Chernobyl and the end of the Cold War, there was a loss of political will. Public opinion became more anti-nuclear, there was increased scrutiny into nuclear safety, making it more difficult and expensive to build nuclear reactors, and energy security in general took the back burner. As a result, successive governments flip-flopped on extending the life of nuclear plants and on launching new developments. This culminated with the announcement to bring nuclear down to 50% of France's electricity mix. Close as many as 17 nuclear power plants. All of this led to underinvestment and the aging of France's nuclear fleet. Throughout the 2000s and 2010s, the share of France's available nuclear fleet fell steadily from 84% to 74% in 2020. But nothing can offer a better dive into the pit in which France's industry has fallen than the Flamanville EPR, the European pressurized reactor. A larger and safer design, it was meant to be the crown jewel of France's nuclear fleet. It was a prototype which was meant to be finished in 2012, but is 12 years too late and nearly 16 billion euros over budget. This report, commissioned by the French economy minister to investigate its issues, shows the scale of the problem. It states that the EPR's difficulties are the result of a fragmented industry which forgot how to work together, with reports of infighting between different companies over contracts. This was compounded by lost expertise through decades of inactivity, a shortage of trained staff, a reactor design focused on being hyper safe but too complex to build, and evolving safety regulation during the building process. This alongside difficulties in construction abroad eventually killed France's nuclear export industry, with potential clients choosing cheaper and simpler reactor designs. Domestically, it also served as an excuse to not invest in new reactors. And this brings us back to today, where underinvestment and neglect have crippled much of France's nuclear fleet in the very energy crisis they were meant to protect against. This is the result of 20, perhaps even 30 years of short-sightedness, and it has left EDF in a sorry state. With no new nuclear reactors having been built over the past two decades, EDF plans to prolong the lifetime of its existing reactors from 40 to 50 or even 60 years at great cost. The construction delays, dividend payouts, anti-monopoly measures by the EU, and cost of repairs of an aging fleet have led to high levels of debt, after a period of time in which EDF should have been lining its pockets. This has been made worse by COVID-19, which delayed repairs, and the war in Ukraine, which saw EDF used as a cash cow by the French government to prevent energy inflation. And so, to save EDF from the mess it in part created, the government has opted to nationalize the company. France ordered two new batches of reactors, six EPR2s with an option on eight in a later batch, and promised to help fund them. The French government has also moved to reconsolidate the French nuclear industry under its helm. Framatome was bought by EDF, as was the former Alstom, which had become part of General Electric, and Orano was bought by the French state. And the French government has once again adopted a very much hands-on approach to its plan. On the basis of the Fultz report, it opened a new school to train the workers it needs. In other words, it's trying to recreate the conditions that made it success in the 1970s and 80s. But the industry faces a tough road to recovery. With its high levels of debt, EDF needs to raise funds on the markets. And while the EU has included nuclear in its green taxonomy, opening the way to the finances EDF needs to build new nuclear reactors, that inclusion is being contested by the Austrian government in court. Furthermore, the focus on two new reactor designs, the EPR2 and a small modular reactor, rather than the EPR, means it once again faces a steep learning curve. And it faces international competition from Chinese, Russian, Japanese, and particularly Korean companies that have snapped up international contracts. But for the French, the nuclear industry is a matter of national pride. And in many ways, it's too big to fail. But what do you think? Can France save its nuclear industry? Or do you have a different conclusion? Feel free to check out the sources in the description down below. 
And while you're there, please consider clicking on the link to my Patreon to join the cohort of Europeans at heart who help make these videos possible.